Hey everyone, today's video is going to venture into transplant surgery. And I found that one of the things that makes transplant surgery so interesting, but also uh, so intimidating and sometimes hard to uh, get a grasp on is the medications and the medical management surrounding transplant patients. So we're going to focus a little bit on the immunosuppression and the infectious prophylaxis for transplant patients. And to be clear, we're talking about abdominal transplant here, and even more specifically, kidney and pancreas transplant. Uh, liver transplant is something that we will save for another day. So again, these are broad topics. These are rapidly evolving fields. We're going to take a 10,000 foot view of this topic and uh, hopefully build up a reasonable framework that will help you uh, approach the transplant station patient and the transplant medications with a little bit less trepidation in the future. So before we talk about immunosuppression, we should say a few brief words about rejection. So first, you know, we learn about the cell mediated and antibody mediated, and we get all these facts in our heads about rejection. But the, the one thing I want you to remember is that cell mediated rejection is far more common than antibody mediated. Uh, especially now that we have good matching. So there's ABO matched uh, organ donation as well as uh, pretty good HLA matching. We can screen for donor specific antibodies, things like that. So most of the immunosuppression regimen is going to be targeted against this cell mediated immunity. Uh, of course, and from a big picture, we're just talking about our immune system's way to recognize non-self, which tends to be done in the cell medi mediated fashion uh, via T cells. And those T cells tend to use the IL-2 pathway. And so we'll keep coming back to the idea of T cells and IL-2 as we go through the immunosuppression medications. So first we should talk about there being three modes of immunosuppression. First, there's induction. When the transplant first happens, you put on a pretty heavy dose of uh, immunosuppression because those first three to six months are kind of the highest risk time for the body to reject that organ. Um, However, there is some overlap between the drugs used for induction and then the drugs used for the other regimens. Then you have maintenance therapy, which is really, I think, what most of us think of, the regimen that a transplant patient is on long-term to prevent uh, rejection of that organ. And then finally, there's anti-rejection regimens for immunosuppression. And we're not going to focus too much on that today, uh, primarily because that's just like induction, essentially. It's a higher intensity regimen uh, because your body is rejecting, you're trying to kind of beat the immune system back down um, to a state where it's going to allow that organ to coexist. Um, and so I think if you have a good sense of what's used for induction, uh, you can get a good sense of how an anti-rejection regimen might be um, designed. And those uh, rejection episodes now with good modern immunotherapy don't usually happen until many months post-op. Uh, so those are usually dealt with with by a medical transplant service as opposed to surgeons like ourselves. All right, so first let's talk about kind of the most basic, most common uh, regimen for immunosuppression, which is maintenance. And most commonly, again, we're talking in broad generalities here. So I'm usually going to just give the one main example of these things. And then I think once you have that down, you'll be able to go out and learn uh, all the unique exceptions or nuances of your specific transplant program. But I'd say the most common regimen for maintenance is a triple therapy uh, using uh, first a CNI or calcineurin inhibitor or equivalent medication, second an anti-metabolite or an anti-proliferative medication, and third using corticosteroids. So let's talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. So first calcineurin inhibitors, also known as CNIs, as you saw on the other page. Uh, the main workhorse for this group, sorry about these background sirens, the main workhorse for this group is by far tacrolimus. Um, this is also known as Prograph. It can also be known as FK506. All those are names for the same thing, which is tacrolimus. Uh, it um, inhibits IL-2 synthesis, which once again goes back to inhibiting this whole T-cell IL-2 pathways that are so important for cell-mediated rejection. Cyclosporin is a different medication, um, often abbreviated CSA, uh, that does similar things to tacrolimus. It was actually invented first, I believe, but is a little bit less potent. Um, so tacrolimus is by far the workhorse of this class. Sometimes you'll have patients that don't do well with tacrolimus or cyclosporin, and those patients can often be put on a drug called 
Sirolimus, which works via mTOR inhibition. I always found this confusing because I figured that Tacrolimus and Sirolimus, you know, the limus in each name were in the same group. But no, it's actually Tacrolimus and Cyclosporin that are both calcineurin inhibitors. And Sirolimus is in a completely different group entirely as an mTOR inhibitor. And again, the mTOR inhibition uh, affects those same pathways related to T cell activation. And something important to know about these calcineurin inhibitors um, or this kind of class of medications, they're incredibly effective. They've really trans revolutionized transplant and transplant surgery, uh, but they do come with a whole host of side effects. So some important ones to think about. Um, Tacrolimus, ironically, with how much it's done to promote kidney transplant, is nephrotoxic. It actually causes some really bad issues with the kidneys, especially when its dose is too high. So these medications, all of them really, but definitely tacrolimus uh, is measured daily and it, then decreasing down to a few times a week initially because high levels of tacrolimus will actually uh, damage the kidneys so significantly that you can see significantly elevated creatinines, um, you can see worse than kidney function, et cetera. So you really have to balance the dosing of these drugs carefully. Other side effects to note, tacrolimus can have some bad uh, CNS effects like seizures or tremors. And then sirolimus, kind of the buzzword side effect that goes with sirolimus is really poor wound healing. And all transplant patients, uh, because of their immune suppressions, have poor wound healing, but sirolimus is even particularly uh, notable in that regard. All right, so first we have our calcineurin inhibitors, then we have our anti-proliferatives or anti-metabolite medications. Uh, they're called this name because they are inhibitors of purine synthesis. So, of course, if you cannot synthesize uh, DNA base pairs, you can't uh, synthesize DNA at all. And one of the most important molecules that needs to be synthesized during cellular, cellular replication or proliferation, of course, is uh, DNA. And so, again, I list the most common drug first. So, mycophenolate or mycophenolic acid, uh, frequently uh, mycophenolate sodium. Um, also abbreviated as MMS. This is supposed to say MMF uh, because there's also mycophenolate mofetil uh, are two different formulations of an anti-proliferative medication that is usually the most common used. It's the more modern, more potent medication. The older anti-proliferative medication is azathioprine. Uh, and both of these, of course, have side effects as well. Again, if you think about what tissues in your body are highly proliferative and therefore might be affected by these drugs, you've got to think about the GI tract. They can have bad GI side effects, diarrhea, uh, pain, issues like that, uh, because the mucosa of these tissues are highly, uh, rapidly proliferating tissues. And finally, we have corticosteroids. I think we all have a pretty good sense of corticosteroids from our time in medical school, so I won't beat a dead horse here, but we know that corticosteroids have a ton of nasty side effects, and so uh, there's been a lot of benefit in decreasing the doses of these medications as we've gotten uh, the other medications that we talked about previously. So remember, classic triple therapy, one, CNI, calcineurin inhibitors, or an equivalent like sirolimus, two, anti-proliferative agents, and then three, corticosteroids. All right, so now we've covered the classic maintenance therapy, and we're going to kind of go back in time to induction. What medications do we give at the time of transplant to prevent an early episode of rejection in these patients. These are usually a combination of bolus corticosteroids, um, as well as an immunosuppressive antibody that really powerfully inhibit the immune system, um, especially those antibodies, the effect lasts. So it really lasts for like the first three to six months post-transplant, which is a critical time uh, for pre preventing rejection episodes, because once you get beyond that time, period, uh, the frequency of rejection episodes just goes down naturally for whatever reason. So when I think about induction, and again, I talked about there's already those bolus corticosteroids, and these are some of the common medications uh, when thinking about the antibodies used for induction. And I like to think of these as a spectrum from least intense up here at the top to most intense immunosuppression. And remember that most intense is not always best because uh, you're, we're always balancing the risks of rejection of the organ versus a really severe um, opportunistic infection, infection due to that immunosuppression. So in a situation where you can get away with less immunosuppression, that's often better for the patient. Uh, but in a situation maybe where you have a highly immunogenic organ like the pancreas, or you have donor-specific antibodies or some sort of 
uh, autoimmune issue that led to the passive transplant where you need more immunosuppression, then you would have to sacrifice that higher risk of infection to do a more intense drug. And so just to go into each one specifically, first we have basiliximab or Simulect. This is a monoclonal antibody uh, to CD25, which is a part of the IL-2 receptor on T cells. Again, no, we're always talking about IL-2 and T cells here. Uh, and what's important to know about this is that it is non-depleting. So while it inhibits the effects of T cells, it does not actually deplete them. Um, some of these other, medica other medications will deplete T cells. And um, if you think about other um, medical conditions where T cells are de depleted, you might think about uh, HIV and AIDS, autoimmune immunodeficiency syndrome, right? You actually, you should think that depleting your T cells is a very significant uh, medical therapy to, to do and that we shouldn't take that lightly. So again, basiliximab, aka Simulac, is a non-depleting antibody to uh, CD25. I don't think these details are that important, but I'm just writing them out here so you can see them, uh, which is related to IL-2. Next, most intense, a step up, is the antithymocyte globulin, sometimes abbreviated ATG or thymoglobulin. Uh, this is a polyclonal antibody uh, that's actually derived from rabbits. So they inject rabbits with T cells and they form antibodies against them. Then we harvest those um, antibodies and inject them into humans. So obviously this is not monoclonal. It's kind of messier. It's not so targeted uh, and it does deplete your T cells. Uh, so it uh, provides a more significant response than basiliximab, uh, but of course at high risk of infection. I should have mentioned basiliximab is usually a single dose, at least at our center. Uh, thymo is usually given over several days postoperatively. And finally, we have the hammer, alemtuzumab, also known as Campath. This is another monoclonal antibody. This one is to CD52, conveniently the reverse of basiliximab, uh, 25 versus 52. And this is a, a marker of T cells. So this severely depletes, depletes your body's T cells. Uh, with just a single dose at the time of surgery. All right, and then there's rejection, or they should probably say uh, anti-rejection regimens for managing your immunosuppression. Um, like I said, we're not going to cover this. This is usually a transplant medicine as opposed to a transplant surgery problem. And it's basically a variation on the idea of induction where you're giving a big hit of immunosuppression frequently with a steroid bolus and taper, uh, potentially with some of those uh, immunosuppressive antibodies. So those cover your three areas, maintenance, induction, and anti-rejection uh, immunosuppression. Of course, there's much more we didn't talk about. There's newer agents like Velatocept, and there's different types of regimens. But hopefully that's a general framework that helps you wrap your head around some ideas. And then the last thing we're going to talk about are the consequences of immunosuppression. We briefly mentioned a few of them, but let's go into a little bit more detail because this is a really important part of managing transplant surgery patients. First, the inflammation and the immune system is a big part of the healing process, right? Paradoxically, it can go out of whack in autoimmune disorders, but typically inflammation is the first step to healing. So patients on immunosuppression often have slow wound healing. Uh, clinically, will leave in things like staples or sutures uh, for maybe more like three to four weeks or even longer, as opposed to the relatively shorter time frame after a general surgery in a non-immunosuppressed patient. Uh, they also will have unreliable abdominal exams. And uh, part of the pain response, again, is mediated by the immune system. So we'll see patients on these high doses of steroids. They can have uh, medical pathologies that would be associated with severe peritonitis. You can see our abdominal exam fundamentals video for more discussion about peritonitis in the abdominal exam. But in transplant patients, you could have people with perforated colon, stool throughout the belly that don't even feel a thing and have a normal exam just because of how immunosuppressed they are. So you have to have a high index of suspicion in these patients if they're not doing well to get imaging uh, because you can't rely on exam like you can in other populations. Finally, we touched on this as well, medication toxicities. Uh, if somebody comes in with an elevated creatinine and poor renal function, uh, you might think about an issue with the graft, you might think about an infection, uh, but you really need to also think about medication toxicities as well. Things like tacrolimus levels being super therapeutic can cause um, dysfunction of that renal allograft, CNS uh, symptoms, et cetera. So, you really need to think about, keep those on your differential um, 
whereas medication toxicities are something we rarely have to think about in most surgical patients. Then finally, maybe the uh, biggest and most obvious side effect of immunosuppression is the risk of infections and opportunistic infections. We're going to talk about that right now. And so the way we fight against these infections in a lot of ways is with prophylaxis. And while there's a dizzying array of potential infections that these transplant patients can get, we only prophylax against a few. Um, and of course, that's for various reasons. Uh, these medications have to be relatively non-toxic, have to be relatively resistant to organisms developing resistance to them, um, et cetera. So there's only a few, and we're uh, going to talk about those here because I think that brings some clarity to the other medications that patients frequently start post-transplant. So key organism, CMV, if you only remember one organism, it's probably the key organism to remember, cytomegalovirus associated with various infections, especially along the GI tract. Uh, we prophylax with that using val gancyclovir. Probably spelled that wrong, but you get the point. Valgancyclovir. Um, what's nice is valgancyclovir also has effects against HSV and VZV, herpes simplex virus, varicella zoster virus. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes if both the donor and the recipient are negative for CMV, you don't really need CMV prophylaxis. And in that case, you might give prophylaxis just against HSV and VZV, and that would be acyclovir. So people are usually on one of these medications, but not both. And then finally, you also want to prophylax against PJP, formerly PCP, uh, pneumocystis gervichii pneumonia, and that medication is TMP sulfa, also known as Bactrim. And it conveniently also hits these organisms, Listeria and Toxoplasma. Uh, but when we really think about what we're using it for, you should think PJP. So CMV, HSV, VZV, and PGP. P PJP. So again, CMV prophylax by valgancyclovir. This also covers HSV, VZV. Those two can be covered on their own by cyclovir and then PJP factor. How long are we getting prophylaxis? Again, think about how long your induction immunosuppression lasts, usually about three to six months. So this is not a lifelong thing for patients. Uh, it's just given during the time the induction regimen is working. Of course, if somebody gets an anti-rejection uh, dose of medication, then you might want to put them back on this immunosuppression, or sorry, this uh, infectious prophylaxis, because they are again at higher risk in that situation. All right, I say this for most of my videos, but I want to really emphasize that this was not comprehensive. This was meant to be a bare bones, 10,000 foot view to get you oriented to this complex and interesting field that is transplant immunology. Um, every center will usually have their own regimen for immunosuppression and for infectious prophylaxis. But I think this uh, gives a good grounding and key concepts that will help you learn that the nuances on the, of that regimen, no matter what it is and no matter where you are. Uh, again, like all videos, this is for educational purposes only. Do not use this to diagnose or treat any disease. And we'll see you next time.